Becoming animal is a popular concept and becoming itself is actually given a whole plateau in a thousand plateaus. Becoming and becoming animal are also discussed elsewhere in the book on Kafka and in the great books that made Deleuze famous logic of sense and difference and repetition. The concept of becoming is also a major feature of the work of Bergson, who Deleuze admires. What I'm going to suggest is that we follow our usual approach and start with the examples of becoming that we can find in a thousand plateaus, um, especially the examples of becoming animal. Um, I've already briefly discussed becoming woman, another major application, on video 7 on lines of flight. OK, let's start. Lots of people seem to like this concept and becoming animal is an especially popular term. It's sometimes seen as a way of communicating deeply with animals, quite often pet animals. The details of how you become animal are discussed less often, but some people seem to think it involves treating animals as if they were human, giving them equal rights, attempting to imitate them or communicate them in some imaginative way. Now, I'm sorry if the approach here seems a bit less emotionally satisfying, but I think becoming animal means philosophizing, again, in a fairly cool, even if focused and intense way about animals and their capacities. I take intense here to mean being fully aware of thought processes, including the impacts of affects and percepts, which are often not conscious. What we're going to do is study animals in a particularly rigorous way and in some small-scale detail. And I think this is what Deleuze and Guattari mean by transcendental empiricism more generally. The transcendental bit means that after we've fully studied all the diverse characteristics of things, we then have to philosophize about how they all came to be collected together like that. That involves abandoning the usual large scale or molar concepts about animals in this case, which limit our understanding and our perceptions, usually in the interests of social control. The main gain will not necessarily be a nicer, warmer or more equal relationship with animals, but it will certainly be a much better informed one. We start as ever then with a thousand plateaus and the plateau on becoming. In this book, Deleuze and Guattari are keen to illustrate their philosophical commitments with examples from the popular culture of the day, and this plateau offers the most extensive examples. The examples include commercial films like Willard, vampires in fiction, street performers, or perhaps their music hall acts. Unfortunately, I never tracked down Alex the Trotter, who is mentioned, apparently who demonstrates becoming horse while playing the harmonica. Alchemy is also mentioned, and we ramble on to theology and music as well while we're here, just as we would if we were having a nice discussion in a Parisian salon or an informal seminar with Professor Deleuze at the Sorbonne. I should also say that music is a frequently used example. Unfortunately, I'm not a musician. I did think Bergson used a musical example rather well in his discussion of becoming, though, which is similar to Deleuze's, and I've cited Bergson 1954 here. References as usual on the transcript. Bergson says that at one level, music just offers a sequence of sounds, but they do add to each other cumulatively. The early sounds qualify or add quality to later ones in various ways. So the overall effect is different from each of the sequential sounds on its own. And that example indicates the sort of qualitative changes that are at the heart of duration or becoming for Bergson. We've also discussed one of the examples in this plateau when we looked at the concept of hexiety in an earlier video. Hexieties, you remember, are individualized assemblages of objects and events which come together, 
or if you like, become, by accident. Although technically there's no such thing as an accident, just a particularly unpredictable event. These becomings or coming togethers have affects on human beings. Constant collisions indicate a sort of empirical or actual becoming because objects and events as they collide with others constantly acquire new characteristics. Hexeities, you will remember, are always a heterogeneous combination of characteristics, never simple unities. And we can refer to this when we discuss one of the famous examples about the dog in the road. We perceive dogs all the time, of course, but how often do we really notice them in detail and what they do? It seems that this dog in question is a particularly lively and energetic dog that is walking in a particular way on a particular road at a particular time and this gets the attention of a particular person the whole forms a hexiety. So we can see why this particular dog affected one of the characters in Virginia Woolf's novel. Incidentally, I think the novel in question is The Waves, although it's not specifically recommended. One of the characters encounters this particular dog trotting around freely in its own little world, and this helped one of the characters feel that she was a free spirit too. Now you remember that uh, Deleuze and Guattari like this notion of hexiety and argue that this is typical, uh, this sort of episode, about how our character is formed. There is no simple unity for a person, even for an author. We're told that we're nothing but hexiates. Okay, well there are also mentions of the cult books by Castaneda. I've called him Castaneda in an earlier tape, sorry. Um, probably Castaneda is the better way to pronounce it. These are books about sorcery. And uh, in this particular one, uh, the results of an experiment to take peyote are being described. What happens is the hero, a naive anthropologist, takes part in a peyote ritual and encounters a dog who is able to communicate with him. The dog also clearly demonstrates a kind of aura that surrounds living beings, a series of lines that connect them to each other and to the environment. This gets us on to becoming animal. And you might remember first, we discussed this a bit when looking at lines of flight in Kafka. And becoming animal for Kafka was a way of breaking out of the usual subjective stances that dominate literature. Kafka did not get there by imitating animals or mystically bonding with them, but by systematically thinking out differences between humans and animals. Now, whether this exercise is successful or not is debatable. I'm not terribly impressed myself. However, there is another example mentioned in this particular plateau, and that concerns the novel Moby Dick, which happens to be one of my favourite novels, if it's a novel. The captain of the whale ship, Captain Ahab, intends to become whale, we are told. Now, the bits of the book that they actually cite in this plateau come towards the end, where the clash between Captain Ahab and Moby Dick is clearly becoming inevitable. We're told that Ahab has in his cabin a chart with lots of lines drawn upon it and this helps him predict where whales can be found at particular times of the year. We're told by the narrator that this is actually fairly routine practice in the whaling industry because the whales are to some extent predictable. Well, we didn't know that. However, Ahab has intensely and obsessively added all sorts of extra information to this chart relating to the particular passage of one whale in particular, Moby Dick. Every time he encounters another ship, he asks if they've seen the white whale, and then he goes down to his cabin to add whatever information he might have gathered. So there might be some mystical process involved, where Ahab thinks of himself as a whale, but I can't actually find anything in the book that suggests that. Basically, the whole thing is based oh dear, 
on careful and systematic observation and experience, a seaman's knowledge of tides, times, locations and so on. And it is a far more systematic understanding that's available to most people who've never been on a whale ship. And of course it's successful. So the process of narrowing down the hunt also involves Ahab becoming less human. He's no longer content just to hunt whales as any commercial fisherman would. His first mate, Starbuck, points out they've already missed several opportunities to catch whales and he urges the captain to kill some more whales as quickly as possible and then head for home just as any normal fisherman would. But Ahab makes it clear that he seeks a particular whale and Starbuck eventually sees that the captain is not a normal human. He suspects insanity. Ahab certainly describes or rather displays increasingly be isolated behaviour and eventually gives up even the normal human comforts of eating with the other officers or smoking a pipe. We realise that the whole thing is going to end in some tragic confrontation where people will be killed. Ahab reassures Starbuck that nothing can be done, that they're set on a track which is preordained. So fleshing out this example a bit, what we have here is Ahab stepping aside from the conventional human identity of whale ship captain. He takes a different stance towards a whale, no longer seeing it as just a resource to be pursued and killed rationally. The whale is also an unusual whale, an anomalous animal, in the terms of Deleuze and Guattari, because of its appearance which includes many scars from earlier encounters with hunters, as well as being white, and because of the way it behaves. It seems to have gained a lot of knowledge of human beings and how they hunt. When the whale clashes with the captain, they both enter some grey area, where the normal distinctions between humans and animals do not apply, and neither behave according to their predictable characteristics. Deleuze and Guattari describe this as Ahab wanting to become whale, but I think this is actually a bit sloppy. Ahab wants to become Moby Dick in particular, and he wants to become Moby Dick in order to fully take part in this great tragedy that he's acting out. Now, sorry if I sound pedantic, but it's a bit of a stylistic flourish to discuss fictional characters and not the authors who constructed them. So for me, it's the author, Herman Melville, who shows Becoming Whale. Melville constantly, throughout the book, shows us characteristics which we never knew about. The enormous physical capacities and endurance of the whales, their tenderness towards their fellows and their kin the way they behave when they're elderly, the fatalistic, rather noble, way they die. A lot of this is anthropomorphic and imaginative, no doubt, but Melville did serve on a whaling ship and he must have observed whales close up. There was even a real incident, he records, when a whale attacked and sank a ship. Melville quotes this along with other authorities on whales and their behaviour. In fact, the whole book is full of detailed observations of whales, their anatomy, as well as their behaviour. It's almost like a documentary at times. What I'm saying is, this is how you become animal, using that sort of systematic approach. Let's get back to Deleuze and Guattari's text. At about page 300, we get into becoming animal, starting with the conventional forms we already have. And we're told we have to extract particles, noting the relations of movement and rest, speed and slowness, slowness, that are closest to what one is becoming. We discuss these Spinozan terms about movement and rest in the video on the hexiety. Uh, they relate to the dimensions of the hexiety. We're told that becoming involves proximity, not analogy. And it's possible because there actually is a zone of proximity or 
to use the quoted term, a co-presence of particles. Now a footnote reminds us that proximity in set theory also means neighbourhood. We can note the emphasis here on the molecular and as before I don't think this means a literal exchange of molecules like the rather fashionable notion that we are entangled at the subatomic level with the rest of the world. I think it means instead focusing on the routine small-scale encounters and behaviours which humans and animals display and which frankly subverts the big general molar capacities, the big categories we normally use. In the second example, Freud talks about a child known only as little Hans and the anxiety attacks that he suffered. One thing to say straight away is that Freud never met the child personally, but discussed him with Hans' father, who was a fan of Freud. We can see straight away that this is a rather indirect analysis. It is even more debatable when Deleuze and Guattari decide to solve the lad's problems based on Freud's account. That makes theirs a third-hand account. Very briefly, the anxiety that Hans experienced seemed to be connected to horses. He had seen a horse urinating in the street and had become distressed. Freudians will be twitching immediately and the anxiety will be connected to the child's worries about his own penis. The child's mother had threatened to cut off his penis if she caught him playing with it. This threat seems to have been fairly widespread among the middle classes of Vienna. Hans was also disturbed by other things that horses did as they worked in a transport depot opposite his house. Horses sometimes stumbled on the cobbles and lay there writhing. Sometimes they were beaten until they got up. The depot itself had other mysteries, including a bunch of street kids who played with the wagons. Hans's father worked through some obvious forms of Freudian analysis with Freud. The horses with their blinkers might stand for the father himself with his spectacles and whiskers. That was too obvious for Freud. Horses lying in the street writhing and kicking their feet could be some symbolic version of sexual intercourse. The father denied that the lad had ever witnessed any such primal scene. Freud noticed that the anxiety was increased when Hans went to visit his relatives to look at their new baby. He travelled in a horse-drawn carriage to do so. Freud finally suggested that the anxiety was due to Hans dreading the arrival of a new baby. It was not so much the horses that suggested this as the box carriages that they pulled. Things were put into and taken out of the box carriages, just as things were put into and taken out of women's bodies. The impression is given that this analysis led to successful therapeutic discussion between Hans and his father to resolve the lad's anxiety. I don't know what you will have made of this, but for Deleuze and Guattari it shows how Freud wants to reduce everything to the same old analyses. Every action becomes symbolic. Every anxiety reveals the same old problems with infantile sexuality, including Oedipal hang-ups. Instead, perhaps little Hans was just trying to expand his experience in a nice rhizomatic direction away from the stifling family atmosphere, out into the street where he could play with street urchins and horses. His respectable parents would allow no such thing, of course, but he was interested in horses and their behaviour. It was both challenging and anxiety-producing as he watched them carefully through the window of his house. Had Guattari been treating him, he would no doubt have encouraged a transversal movement to follow the lad's interest and get him in touch with horses. So, little Hans, according to Deleuze and Guattari, wants to pursue a rhizome or a line of flight. He is particularly interested in the animals he has observed carefully. He does not want to work with the categories that adults apply to these animals. He wants to explore for himself. He wants to become horse. Now, I'm aware that we don't normally see things like this, but as I have insisted throughout, we are not doing normal thought. We're doing philosophy. 
And what we are being shown in these examples is how to go beyond normal thought, how to understand animals in a much more detailed and open-ended way. Becomings are not just philosophical exercises, they're driven by desire. And I think we can see this with the examples that we've mentioned. Ahab is obsessed. Little Hans is desperate to get away. Castanada's heroes already invested a lot of time and energy in understanding the world of the sorcerer and he wants to carry on with it. Neither Ahab nor little Hans wanted to imitate animals nor to bond with them emotionally, nor was it just an imaginative exercise for either of them. And there's a central quote here on page 262 that makes this clear for me. I quote, But neither is it a resemblance, comma, an imitation, comma, or at the limit, comma, an identification. Becomings animal do not just occur in the imagination and are neither, quote, dreams nor fantasies. They are perfectly real. But which reality is at issue here? End of quotes. Here's another one. Open quotes. What is real is the becoming itself, comma, the block of becoming, not the supposedly fixed terms through which that which becomes passes. End of quote. Now that quote comes in the middle of a reminder that Spinoza was interested in urging us to rethink what a body can do. That is, not just assuming it fits nicely into what it is supposed to do. Now, normally we think of animals as pets, as workers or as food. But, obviously, they're more fascinating than that. They do more than just conform to our categories. When you observe them closely, as Hans did from his window, or as Ahab does on board the Pequod, they reveal quite new abilities and capacities. In my own limited experience, for example, they're often stronger and cleverer than we think. For me, the best contemporary examples of people who've really observed and understood the capacities of animals are horse whisperers or animal wranglers in general. They've observed animals very carefully. They've observed how they interact with human beings. They've worked out what stresses them and what doesn't, and so on. The qualities that interest Deleuze and Guattari include what happens when animals act as a pack. They see pack action as a kind of living multiplicity containing much more power and potential and changing the behaviour of individuals. Freud is told off again, for example, in the second plateau, for not grasping the interests of one of his patients, the wolfman, specifically in pack behaviour, not the behaviour of a single wolf. The whole discussion reminds me of some early French work on human behaviour and how it changes in crowds. That might be deliberate on the part of Deleuze and Guattari. They like to remind humans throughout a thousand plateaus, that animals also live socially, communicate with each other, have a certain amount of freedom to act, and so on. Although, for my money, they have to stretch the meaning of words like freedom to do that. Anyway, we should look in these examples for the basis of becoming in reality. We're told this will be a different reality. And again, I quote, it will be open quotes, a reality specific to becoming. That's page 263. As in all the cases we've discussed so far, we start by discussing becoming animal, but we end with a discussion of what reality is and how it operates. We know that Deleuze and Guattari operate with two kinds of reality, virtual and actual. In actual reality, that's the normal one, all sorts of boundaries, limits and categories have developed, usually for social and political reasons, and they surround and constrain us. They include very limiting categories when it comes to dealing with animals, like the ones I mentioned just now, pet or food, all of which raise humanity to some exalted status as not animal. 
While in virtual reality, there is, by contrast, much more potential for variation and possibility. Close observation and philosophical thought reveals some of this hidden potential. So we need to examine very carefully the specific actual examples we're dealing with, animals in this case, aiming to see this level of potential or virtuality in them and in everything. Well, in this case, there's some more modern ways of thinking that might help. We know that human beings, horses and whales really did have a common ancestor. In Deleuzean terminology, the abstract machine that produced mammals produced the specific forms of humans and horses. And I think this is what they're getting at in their rather obscure bits about evolution in this plateau. Basically, we still share a lot of our DNA in common with horses and dogs, don't we? Well, the plateau ends with some more technical stuff about how this virtual reality is actually constituted in terms of a number of different sorts of planes. Well, I'm still going to leave that aside for now. What we get from this for now is that a fully philosophical grasp of becoming leads to general conclusions that boundaries around objects and events might look natural, but they're simplifications. There's only the reality of endless becoming. In virtual reality, things don't have boundaries around them. They become imperceptible. And becoming imperceptible is discussed on pages 27728. That includes human beings. Well, we've briefly touched on becoming woman in the video before this one. Deleuze and Guattari also discuss becoming child, and I find this is an issue that particularly interests those working with children. I'm not going to discuss it now. I wonder if you can work out for yourselves what they actually might mean by it.